pleasure to welcome Dr. Ben Hunt today from MIT, uh, one of our faculty candidates in, in the department. Uh, so, so Ben grew up in Toronto, so I assume he's a Leafs fan. Uh, but he moved on to do uh, his PhD at uh, Cornell, which he received in 2009. He worked with James Davis on uh, superfluid dose injections and then super solidity, which was all the rage at the time. And Ben's work was sort of instrumental in, in figuring out what the heck was actually going on in solid healing condition. It's one of the situations when uh, the more exotic answer was whatever we would first and turned out to not be the case. Uh, so since then, he's, he's moved on to a postdoc at MIT, working with Ray Shorey, and he swapped bosons for fermions, so he studies electrons at variable temperature now, spectroscopy, and uh, more recently, graphene. Uh, he's going to tell us about some of that work today. So thank you very much. And the token of our appreciation will get to get you started. Thank you. Shall I open it right now? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little strange to start off my talk by poking a gift in front of her. Uh, uh, <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for the kind of invitation to come uh, to Vermont and to tell you about the work that we've done. Uh, over the last couple of years uh, at MIT. Um, so I'm going to tell you about how we engineer new electronic states in uh, header structures that we make out of graphene and other materials. Um, and so I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the way that we do this and the sort of material science um, that goes along with that. But then hopefully I'll get quickly to uh, the physics that, that we discovered over the last couple of years, which I think is pretty exciting. So uh, let me start by thanking my collaborators, especially Tiger Sanchez Yamagishi and Andre Young, with whom I did all of the work uh, on equal footing. And uh, it was done in the lab with Ray Shuri and Pablo Barrio Morero at MIT. And then we had some great collaborators, both experimental and, and theoretical, around the world. And we were funded by the DOE and by the Moore Foundation. OK, so from the title of my talk, uh, what does engineering new electronic states mean and what does it mean in particular to a condensed matter physicist. So the paradigm is basically that we're going to have a low dimensional system and that we're going to start with the basic building block and then we're going to want to take that basic building block and engineer the coupling between uh, the various building blocks and, uh, and create new, new structures. So the, the sort of prototypical now classic example of this is the two dimensional electron system in a semiconductor header structure. So if you grow gallium arsenide between two other types of semiconductors, the, the electrons in this layer behave as if they're in two dimensions. And then we can take that building block and uh, build up structures with it, and you can get interesting physics and interesting engineering um, out of it. For example, from in the physics direction, if you put these two layers close enough together, you can get something that looks like a superfluid of electron hole pairs, so an exon ex ex condensate. And then from the technological point of view, uh, this two-dimensional system is responsible for any number of things, including transistors in your cell phone, etc. But you can make structures even more complicated where you, each one of these little dips here corresponds to one of these 2D systems, and you can produce really fascinating things like a quantum cascade laser. So um, the building block that I use and that I'm going to tell you about is, is not that semiconductor structure, but instead it's graphene. You may have heard of graphene, it's this two-dimensional uh, honeycomb of carbon atoms. Um, and the reason that we like to use that two-dimensional, uh, that we like to use graphene, is that it's very easy to make. So we learned from this paper uh, in 2004 from Andre Gimes' group uh, that all you need to do to make a two-dimensional layer of carbon atoms is to take graphite, the three-dimensional structure, and literally some scotch tape, and peel off layers. Uh, well, either one by one or many by many. Um, and then when you rub them uh, onto the appropriate substrate, under an optical microscope, you can actually see a single two-dimensional layer uh, of, of carbon atoms. So that's, you can see it right down here. This is a monolayer graphene in the corner here, and some thicker layers uh, in the same piece here. So this kicked off quite a significant re revolution in condensed matter physics, as you can see from the number of citations here um, since 2004 on this paper. So now, under the second part of engineering these new types of electronic states, once we have this basic building block, what we'd like to think about is building up header structures out of this, basically stacking up these materials. Um, and in addition to 
graphene now we have uh, many other types of materials that we can make these types of structures with. So for example, uh, there's graphene, but also boron nitride, uh, aluminum disulfide, tungsten disalinide, and any number of other crystals. So the idea here is that we're going to take these, uh, these layers, stack them up on top of one another, and create new materials with new, new properties. Um, so that goes by the name of a van der Waals header structure, and the, the reason for that is basically that these layers are coupled together uh, weakly by van der Waals forces, which allows us to peel them off, but also to reassemble them. So uh, before I get into too many details, uh, I just want to give you one slide about graphene and tell you why it's so great. Uh, you may have heard some of these things before, but uh, it has all these superlative properties. For example, it's extremely strong and flexible. If you put it over a hole and put a huge pressure across it, uh, you can see that you can measure a Young's modulus of something greater than terapascal, uh, which is better than a lot of ceramics. Um, it has really interesting optical properties as well. For example, um, it absorbs in the broadband exactly 2.3% per layer um, across, the, across the optical spectrum. And it allows you to do things like make flexible touch screens where you can control the opacity of a graphene layer with a voltage that you apply. So this is in the works right now. And you'll probably see graphene touch screens at some point in the near future. And then uh, from the electronic properties point of view, um, because it's very thin, uh, you can induce in immense uh, amounts of charge in the layer that change over four or five or three or four orders of magnitude up to 10 to the 13 electrons per square centimeter. And this goes along with an extremely high current density and a high carrier mobility, which allows you to make high frequency transistors. So, so graphene really is quite a, quite a miraculous material. Um, and if, when you start stacking up graphene and other layers, you can enable other technologies such as uh, transistors that are based on tunneling between electronic tunneling between two graphene layers through a tunnel barrier, and also photovoltaic devices that sense incoming light um, as uh, as an electric current. And what's important again, because they're strong and flexible, is that you can make flexible electronics out of these things. So uh, so there's uh, quite a lot, of, a lot of interest, at least from a technological point of view, in uh, in having these van der Waals header structures. So for the rest of the talk, I'm basically going to uh, be talking about electronic properties of graphene, because that's what, what I know how to measure, basically. Um, so to understand a little bit more about the electronic uh, properties, we're going to switch uh, to physics, and we'll talk a little bit about the physics of graphene. Um, so graphene is this honeycomb lattice. Uh, it has these A and B sublattices. Um, and if you solve for the electronic structure of, of popping uh, electron, say this A site or B site, what you find, uh, as Wallace did in 1947 in the toy model, uh, was that, these, that it has this really interesting structure where the conduction band and the valence band touch at two inequivalent points uh, in this uh, Brillouin zone, in this uh, energy momentum space. Um, and if you zoom in at low energies here, what you find is that the, the appropriate Hamiltonian to describe the, uh, the excitations in the system looks an awful lot like the Hamiltonian that was written down almost 100 years ago by, by Dirac, um, where the energy of, these, uh, of the electrons is actually proportional to the momentum and not to the momentum squared. So what that is, is that, that what that tells you is that the electrons in graphene behave as if they're relativistic particles. Um, they basically behave like photons with no mass uh, and traveling with uh, a velocity which is a fraction of the speed of light. Um, so this, you know, this is really exciting from a condensed matter physicist's point of view because you can study, uh, because you can essentially study the relativistic dynamics of electrons in a solid state system. Um, and these two species of massless direct fermions come in two, two flavors. Um, it's because basically these two corners here are inequivalent. So you have a, a valley K and a valley K prime, so-called. And so there's an additional quantum number known as the valley quantum number um, of these electrons in addition to the normal electron spin up or down. So there are these fourfold kind of degenerate levels in, in graphene. And maybe most important for the rest of this talk, uh, the Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian here, is actually inversion symmetric with respect to interchange of A and B. Um, and that's, that's a very important point because it means that this so-called Dirac point here, uh, the point where the conduction and valence bands touch, is protected by a symmetry of the system. Um, 
And so that's a very robust property. Okay, so now we know a little bit about the physics of gravity. Uh, let's turn back to engineering structures. Um, so I'm going to start off with a slightly simpler Van der Waals header structure, this sort of proto uh, header structure made from graphene and boron nitride. Um, and the reason that we're interested in this is that when you make these uh, layered structures, although graphene is a very good semi-metal, as you see here, where the, the bands touch, what we would like is a very good dielectric, um, so that we can basically separate the layers, insulate layers from one another, and do that kind of engineering. So, it turns out that this structure, or this, this atom, an example, example boron nitride is an ideal insulator for graphene nanostructures. Uh, basically, it has the same density and same, almost, the same, uh, uh, almost the same bond distance. I don't know if you can see that, but this is basically the same structure as the graphene here. It's this hexagonal lattice, but instead of having the carbons on these A and B sublattices, it has a boron and a nitrogen uh, on the sublattices. And so this distance between these two is, is only different by about 2%. But as I pointed out, the main difference is that graphene is a very good metal, or very good semi-metal, and uh, hexagonal portrait core nitride, because of this difference in foreign and nitrogen atoms, uh, actually turns out to be a very good insulator. Okay, so how do we actually make these things? Um, the way that we make them is almost embarrassingly simple. Um, we, we start off with uh, a, a transparent layer. Um, so this is a soft polymer and then a release layer, which is uh, basically a sacrificial layer. And we, we exfoliate the graphene onto this, uh, onto this transparent stack, and separately we exfoliate hexagonal boron nitride, uh, boron nitride on the silicon wafer. We flip this thing upside down. We use a micro manipulator to move it back and forth, looking through a microscope, and we press them into contact. Um, and we heat up the substrate, and basically this release layer flows. We throw away the soft layer, and we're basically left with graphene on top of hexagonal boron nitride. And so you get a structure that you see up here in the top right, where you can see the single layer of graphene sitting on top of boron nitride here. And you know this would be a nice kind of Friday evening uh, type of experiment, um, except for one fact. Um, and that fact is that when you actually look at a cross section and of uh, a graphene boron nitride structure, this is now a, a stack of eight uh, alternating bilayers. You see that the that the cross sectional cut um, of of, uh, of this structure is perfectly atomically flat at the interface. Uh, very very few ripples, very few defects or anything. So we've gone from this Friday afternoon, Friday evening type of experiment into something that can make real um, high quality uh, atomically flat interfaces between two materials that we basically just slap together. Um, so, uh, and once we do that, here you can see it's a little dark here, but you can see pieces of graphene on boron nitride. We can etch devices out of them, attach electrical leads, um, and you can see how flat the graphene is here in this false color atomic force microscope image. Um, and then maybe even clearer from the scanning tunneling microscopy image, you can see that on silicon oxide, uh, which is a typical substrate for graphene, it's extremely disordered. When we place graphene on top of this hexagonal boron nitride, uh, basically all of that disorder goes away. So this is what I meant by ideal, ideal substrate. And finally, um, and just like you remember the, this slide, um, this is essentially what the transport characteristics look like. Uh, Graphene. So if we fashion graphene into this, um, this kind of uh, transport device here and we measure, say, the resistance of the graphene, what we can do is if we couple it capacitively to a gate, uh, this is just a field effect transistor, uh, we can change the number of electrons in the graphene um, and we can actually tune continuously from uh, hole light conduction to electron light conduction. Uh, by means of this gate electrode. And when we tune the gate, but when we tune the conduction from holes to electrons, we pass through this Dirac point, this so-called charge neutrality point. Um, and what you see, the transport signature of that is, is a peak in the resistance as a function of the gate voltage. So just remember that this is what normal graphene looks like. And that the resistance here of, of this device is a few kilo ohms when the Fermi level is sitting at the Dirac point. Um, Okay, so that's basically where we were, uh, where the field was when 
uh, I started working on this about two years ago. Um, and as I just showed you, there's this resistance peak in a graphing device as a function of a gate voltage. Um, it's a little bit surprising um, because actually even before this was, this was measured for the first time, it was predicted from the theory that if you had a structure in which graphene was sitting on top of boron nitride in this manner, that the graphene would somehow inherit some of the properties from the boron nitride and uh, actually open up a gap uh, in the same way that uh, boron nitride has in the gap. Um, and the conduction here would actually be much, much, much lower than, than as represented by that peak. Um, and opening up a gap in boron nitride or in graphene is actually really nice, it's really appealing because then you can use uh, electrostatic confinement basically to make little nanostructures. This is a picture of what graphene uh, nanostructures look like uh, in the absence of a gap. Basically, in order to make these little quantum dots here, uh, you have to etch things out. So that's, that's actually a very difficult thing to do. So having graphene for um, this gap is very appealing from this point of view. So, what, what, what's the answer? Uh, is there any effect whatsoever of this boron nitride substrate uh, on the electronic structure of the graphene? It looks like from this example that there isn't, but the theory predicts that there should be. Um, so what's the answer? Um, and the answer is that it depends. Uh, and it depends on an additional de degree of freedom that we have in the system, which is that we can twist one graphene layer with respect to the, the underlying boron nitride substrate. So, as you might know, when you superimpose two periodic structures, generically what you get is a Mari pattern. And I hope you can see it, I hope it's not too dark, but you can see as a function of the twist angle between the boron, or between the graphene and the boron nitride layer, that there's this sort of superstructure. And the closer that you twist the, the layers into alignment, uh, the longer this Mari pattern, the superstructure becomes. And again, this is a very generic uh, feature of two superimposed uh, periodic structures. So that Moiré pattern, uh, that superstructure is actually seen from scanning tunneling microscopy images. Um, so this is a, an STM image from our collaborators where you can see the superstructure, uh, which is roughly five to 10 nanometers long. But underlying that, you can actually see the graphene atom or the, the, the size of the graphene atoms as well. So we have a very interesting system here with this kind of periodic structure on top. Um, so we make devices uh, in, this, in this field of back transistor configuration. Um, and in fact, of these, these four devices that we studied, uh, all of these showed Moiré patterns. So these are now uh, STM images of each of these devices that we made. And you can see that this periodic Moiré pattern depends or uh, varies from uh, 3.5 nanometers in this picture to up to 12.3 nanometers in this picture, and this is close to the theoretical maximum of 14 nanometers um, that I showed on the, on the animation slide. Um, and the transport uh, characteristics of these devices are very different than, than what you saw before, and in fact, there's, uh, there's two additional features that I want you to see. One is that there's these additional peaks, uh, these additional satellite peaks in the two devices, the red and blue, uh, with the longest Mari wavelengths. So okay, just go back. Here's one Mari wavelength here at 12.3 nanometers, one at 9 nanometers. And in those two devices, we see this, uh, these additional peaks on the side. And maybe more importantly, because uh, this is a really new thing, um, we're seeing insulating behavior at the direct point here in all four of the devices that we measure. So in all four of these Mari devices. Okay, so this is the, our main, this constitutes our main observation. And let's see if we can understand what's going on. Um, so if you go back to uh, kind of elementary solid state physics, look at Nashkoff and Merman, what you find out is that uh, when you have a periodic structure, um, the energy bands, the normal uh, free electron uh, behavior of electrons gets modified when you get close to momenta that are proportional to one over the wavelength. And what you get there is you get a reconstruction uh, into so-called block bands. You basically get what's called block block or Bragg scattering at these wave vectors. And the free electron dispersion breaks up into these, these so-called block bands. And this happens at relatively high energy because this A here, which is just the lattice parameter, is, is relatively small. And so this is at a high momentum and high energy. 
So you might be able to imagine what happens when you actually have this Mario pattern. It, it's not a, uh, this thing acts like a periodic potential that's not a, uh, that doesn't have a period of A, but has a period of lambda. Now, the roughly 10 nanometers. And so, uh, basically what happens is that this Mari potential reconstructs the normal Dirac cone into so-called mini bands. So, at, at finite energies, uh, finite energies away from, from this Dirac point, you see this reconstruction of the electronic structure. And this energy is proportional to one over the, the wavelength, as you can expect. And this is also seen from STM measurements uh, from our collaborators. Um, and we can actually uh, verify that, that these satellite peaks are coming from the Moiré by basically um, estimating the number of electrons that it takes to fill up uh, one of these Moiré minibands. So you, you can just use an electrostatic model, predict what the, the wavelength should be, and compare to STM, and you find out that indeed the, these numbers actually uh, pair pretty well. So we're pretty happy, we're pretty confident that these satellite peaks here correspond to the, some description of the um, of the, the electronic structure of graphene getting modified. Okay, so we understand these satellite peaks. What's going on with this huge resistance peak at charge neutrality? Um, so you can do temperature dependence of, of this central peak here. What you find out is that it looks basically like activated behavior, that the resistance uh, increases exponentially with temperature, which kind of points to uh, there being maybe a gap opening up in our system. Um, and so we measured this gap, uh, as it deduced from these temperature measurements, as a function of the Moiré wavelength. Um, and what we found, and maybe this is the, the most important uh, part of the first uh, slide and the first part of my talk, is that the, the gap that we measure actually increases as we twist the graphene layer closer to zero to a sample. Um, so that kind of fits with our intuition of the graphene and boron nitride being stronger as coupled at low twist angle, and as we twist away from uh, perfect alignment, the, the gap goes down and we sort of restore the intrinsic behavior of graphene. Um, so what's causing this gap in our system? The obvious thing is that it must be due to AB sublattice symmetry breaking in the same way that there's a gap in boron nitride. Um, but we didn't want to stop here, we have to do some more experiments to, to verify this. Um, so, uh, more physics, next slide. Um, Two-dimensional systems in, in a magnetic field. So when you take graphene and you put it in the large magnetic field, uh, the electrons in the system get quantized in these cyclotron orbits and the, the energy spectrum uh, breaks up into these so-called line numbers, okay? Um, and so, I just want you to remember this for the rest of the talk, or try to remember this for the rest of the talk because it's gonna come up again. Um, the characteristic of graphene lambda levels uh, is that this is the existence of a lambda level exactly at zero energy. And this, the character, this lambda level at zero energy is characteristic of massless Dirac fermions. Right? But this, this is a relativistic, this is the relativistic feature of graphene, if you will. And this thing is fourfold degenerate, again, because of the spin and this value degree of freedom. Okay, so. Um, if you look at the density of states here, if you take a cut at a magnetic field, uh, the density of states, the density of electronic states is very high when you're in one of these electronic bands, and it's very low when you're in one of these gaps between, uh, between the lateral levels. Okay, so, so again, the n equals zero lateral level is characteristic of massless graph fermions. And we can measure, uh, we can measure in a typical graphene sample this density of states basically based on this capacitive, on a capacitance measurement that we can also do. Um, so you can see a peak at zero energy here, which is characteristic of this semi-metallic graphene, uh, or typical graphene. Um, and so this is now what a trace of this lando, these lando levels look like as a function of magnetic field and gate. And you can see in our typical, in a typical semi-metallic graphene structure, the formation of the zero lando level exactly at zero energy. Uh, what happens when we do this with our graphene that is insulating? What we see is something very different. We see that this normal fourfold degeneracy of the lowest lando level has been split. In fact, this lando level never really appears at zero energy. Um, so this fourfold symmetry of, of this lowest lando level has been reduced to a twofold symmetry, 
uh, which points to lifting of one of the one of the two symmetries and probably the sub minus symmetry. Um, I'll skip that, but we, we saw some new fractional quantum all states too, if anybody wants to talk about that. Okay, so uh, what do we see? We see what, what we think is a macroscopic gap due to this AB sublet symmetry breaking, which points to seeing not massless direct fermions, but massive direct fermions. So the massiveness comes from basically from the curvature of the span here, and you can parameterize the gap uh, with, with, the, with the mass. Um, and moreover, the mass or the gap increases as we twist the angle of the graphene relative to the boron nitride. Um, so if we go back to that theory that I showed you before, it, predict, it, it sort of predicts this epitaxial structure should have a gap that's roughly 50 millivolts, uh, which is close to what we see. It's actually up here. We, we measure about 30 millivolts for the, for the, for the lowest twist angle uh, that we have in the system. Um, this picture can't be right, though. I, I told you before that the graphene and boron nitride are 2% different in lattice constant. We know that there's a Moiré pattern, right? And this Moiré pattern, um, if you look in detail at a, at a microscopic model, um, it looks like this picture, the perfectly aligned um, graphene and boron nitride, only in certain areas. So you can kind of this corner and up here and down here. But the overall modulation of the, of the alignment is, is, is different. Um, and what that results in is a gap or a mass that oscillates with, with uh, the period of, of the moray. Um, and so this is an open theoretical problem. We see a gap, but we know that this, this periodic uh, modulation of the gap should, should actually vanish. It goes from being positive to negative. Um, and so that's basically where we are with this with this observation now we've observed this gap that depends on the twist angle um, and we don't have a great theoretical description for where that comes from. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that part. Okay, so this brings me to uh, the second part of my talk uh, about the Hofstadter butterfly. Um, and for this part of the talk, uh, just like you remember that this, that we see this Moray pattern that oscillates essentially with with a 10 nanometer period and it, it behaves like a periodic potential in the system. So this periodic potential um, allows us to, in, to investigate something that's quite interesting, which is a fundamental problem in quantum mechanics. Um, what happens when we take a particle and we put it in a periodic potential and we subject it to a magnetic field? So we know what the answers are in the individual cases. Um, when you just have a potential, uh, we get these block bands, as we talked about before. Uh, when you just have a magnetic field, the electronic spectrum breaks up into lambda levels, uh, which are correspond to these cyclotron orbits, um, these quantized cyclotron orbits. So what happens when this energy scale is the same as one of these energy scales? This is typically much, much, much smaller than this energy scale. Um, what happens if we can make the periodic potential long enough or the magnetic field large enough that match up the, the light scales or the energy scales of these things. So does anybody know? Anybody do that problem in their head? I, I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> Doug Sofstadter famously solved this problem in 1976, um, and this is what he found. Uh, this is what the energy spectrum of an electron in a magnetic field and a period, periodic potential looks like. It, it's this beautiful fractal structure uh, that looks somewhat like a butterfly, which is where the, the name comes from. And here at low energy and low field, you can see, indeed, you have something that looks like uh, lambda levels, as you might expect. But as you uh, change the energy scales and change the light scales, um, well, you, get, you basically get this very complicated structure. And in fact, when he discovered this, uh, when he discovered this problem, the word fractal hadn't been invented yet. So he used words like recursive, uh, you can do something similar. But, um, so when I was a kid, my dad had this book on his shelf, uh, and I used to basically just look at the MC Escher pictures in it. Um, but Hofstadter also included this his Hofstadter butterfly plot, which he called G plot, in the experiment. And what he wrote on that page was, you might well wonder whether 
such an intricate structure would ever show up in any experiment. Frankly, I would be the most surprised person in the world if G-plot came out of any experiment. So this is obviously very uh, tantalizing for an experimentalist to read a sentence like this. Um, so the reason why he would have been surprised is fairly easy to understand. He was thinking of lambda, the period of the periodic potential, as being roughly two angstroms or three angstroms, the size of the, the periodic, uh, basically the periodicity of the lattice, which tells you that you need a magnetic field of roughly 10,000 Tesla. Um, and as Ralph Newman will tell you, you can't even get those kind of magnetic fields at the National High Magnetic Field Lab. So people started thinking about other ways of doing this, um, for example, artificially patterning a super lattice on top of a two dimensional system. And the problem there is basically you get swamped by disorder. Um, you can only make, at the time, you can only make structures that were roughly 100 nanometers, and the disorder on sort of large lengths of scales meant that you couldn't see nice effects of this hot matter butterfly. So uh, that's where the 10 nanometers comes, in, comes into play. Um, this 10 nanometer potential acts like a beautiful periodic potential, and not only does it act like a beautiful periodic potential, but it acts like a beautiful periodic potential on the scale of the whole sample. So we, we basically have a perfect periodic lattice over the scale of maybe 100 times, um, 100 times this lattice constant, or even larger. So, uh, so we have the right conditions to observe the Hofstadter butterfly. How do we actually observe this? Um, and so the next slide is uh, slightly more difficult physics, but um, I hope we can all appreciate how cool this is going to be. Um, <laughs> so the quantum Hall effect. Um, then if you know what the Hall effect is, it's uh, basically if you put uh, a current in a two-dimensional, or in this case, in a two-dimensional system in the presence of a magnetic field, magnetic field will curve the electrons and you'll develop a voltage transverse. And so if you look at the ratio of these two quantities, uh, you get the conductance, basically V over I is the conductance. And what you find in a strong enough magnetic field is actually that the, the conductance becomes perfectly quantized uh, in units of E squared over H. Um, so perfectly quantized that we actually use this now as a definition of the ohm. Um, or the definition of the inverse of the ohm. Um, and the reason why these things are so perfectly quantized is very, for a very deep reason in physics. It's that this, this, uh, this Hall conductance is what's known as a topological quantum number. Okay? Um, this this uh, conductance is robust to any perturbations of the underlying Hamiltonian. If you take this two-dimensional system and you cut it into like a clover leaf, or something like that, it doesn't change this experimental fact, which is a really remarkable thing. Um, and the very, uh, very simple picture of this is that if you imagine this donut to coffee, or this kind of bulk structure as your Hamiltonian, there's a property of this Hamiltonian, which is the number of holes, right, in, in or some analogous thing to the number of holes. So if you deform the Hamiltonian in some way, perhaps by changing the shape of the edge or something like that, what doesn't change about the Hamiltonian is the number of holes in it, um, roughly speaking. <laughs> uh, but, but that's sort of the, and there are, there are close analogies between geometry um, and, and the underlying Hamiltonians of, of this type of system. Um, so as we learned from a very important paper in 1982, these topological quantum numbers are actually properties of filled electronic bands. Okay? So if you have a lambda level structure like uh, like I showed you before with this n equals zero Landau level, um, you can imagine filling up Landau levels as essentially filling up electronic bands, right? So if you are if you fill up say this electronic band, um, you're on one of these uh, diagonals here. When it gets filled up, you're in this gap between these two energy levels. You're sitting on this plateau, actually it's this plateau here. And then as you start to fill this uh, electronic band, you start to move up here. And then when you're filled up there, you're sitting again on one of these plateaus. Okay. So what that suggests is that we can actually color the, the gaps in between these Landau levels according to their quantized Hall conductance. Okay. So basically, uh, these gaps and these gaps in between these energy pans have some um, 
subtopological quantum number associated with this conductance here, and we can color those gaps, those energy gaps, accordingly. So, back to the Hofstadter butterfly. Um, it suggests that we can do the same thing with the Hofstadter butterfly, um, color them according to their quantized small conductance, and so you get a very beautiful picture um, of what the bands, what these gaps should look like in the Hofstadter spectrum. Um, this is energy and magnetic field, by the way. So, what happens in our graphing system? So, if we take this lowest Landau level back here, sorry, let me just go back. This lowest Landau level, which is fourfold degenerate, um, and we put it in a very large magnetic field so that you basically break uh, all of the four symmetries. You get four bands. Sorry, break the two symmetries. You get four bands. Um, and we can now color these, uh, the gaps in between these electronic bands according to their quantized Hall conductance. And so if we measure the quantized Hall conductance of the system, what we'll see is this monotonic sequence of plateaus that go minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, times e squared over h. When we add a periodic potential, um, these bands get changed. They get uh, changed in these Hofstadter-like bands. Um, and so this was a calculation done by our collaborators in Japan. And when we color these, um, we find a similarly beautiful picture of what the quantized Hall conductance looks like. Um, and the important thing here is that when you're in this Hofstadter regime up here, um, so at low fields, you can see that it approximates the monotonic sequence. At high fields, you can see that, in fact, if we look at the quantized Hall conductance, it follows this non-monotonic sequence. So instead of going uh, 0, 1, 2, we go 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2 for electrons and the same for holes. Okay. Okay. So that's the theory. Um, what do the experiments look like? So we took our sample, uh, the graphene sample with the longest wavelength, with 12 nanometers. Um, and we put that in the magnetic field. And uh, at MIT, we could only go up to 13 and a half Tesla here. Um, so what you can see is from those satellite peaks, there's sort of these additional features emanating, but just concentrate on sort of the central feature here. So we could only get to 13 and a half Tesla, um, but we took our device down in Florida to the National High Magnetic Field Lab, put it in the largest DC magnet in North America, uh, 45 Tesla, um, and what you can see is that if you concentrate on the central feature, you can start to see some pretty interesting things happening up here. And these interesting things actually happen, um, this is now the magnetic field, uh, the magnetic flux in units, basically of the, of the flux through one of these more unit cells. You can see in this characteristic uh, value of one, where basically the magnetic length and the periodic potential match up, that you can start to see some really, really cool stuff happening up here. So let's zoom in on that. Um, basically, if you compare it to this to the to the Hofstadter spectrum calculated, you can start to see things, features that are sort of reminiscent of these gaps uh, opening up here, as kind of regions of high conductance adjacent to regions of, of low conductance. Sorry, the color scales of conductance in this. Um, but as I pointed out before, the real kind of smoking gun of the Hofstadter butterfly, at least for this system is to see a non-monotonic sequence of quantum Hall plateaus. And so if you look at low at low density or at low magnetic field 19 Tesla, basically you, you can see, if you just concentrate on the colors, you can see this uh, sequence 0, 1, 2, very simple uh, monotonic sequence of quantum, quantum Hall plateaus. But if you go to the high field regime, this phi, oops, this phi for phi naught greater than 1, you can basically see this 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1 to a uh, sequence of quantum Hall plateaus. So that's really the signature of the small spectrum butterfly that we're seeing in transport. Um, so what I would like to do in the future, this is a transport measurement. You can see it's kind of messy uh, in some places. You have some spurious features from, from, other, from other effects. So what I'd like to do uh, if I come to Vermont is to set up this new spectrum, spectroscopic technique that we use at, at MIT. Um, to look at the real energy spectrum of the Hofstadter butterfly, not just not just the transport signatures. So this is, uh, I'll describe this, uh, well, I, I don't have time to describe this now, but basically it produces a very nice picture of the actual density of states as a function of energy and magnetic field. Um, this is in a two-dimensional electron system, 
um, that's not in the Hofstadter regime. Um, so what I would like to do is to apply this technique to uh, the Hofstadter butterfly and actually be able to resolve the energy levels and maybe deduce uh, the, the degree to which the structure is actually fractal um, and to answer some questions about uh, the interactions, the role of interactions with electrons, etc. in the system. So, um, just to summarize the first part of the talk, uh, the first two parts of the talk, we saw this tunable band gap in massive direct fermions in the graphene system, um, and we also saw the signature of the hostile butterfly in, in extremely high magnetic fields. And the takeaway point that I, I want to leave you with is that basically we saw all of this physics, um, these new electronic states that only exist in this composite structure, in this graphene and boron nitride structure. They don't exist alone in graphene, they don't exist alone in boron nitride, but when we put them together, uh, we start to see some really interesting new physics. Um, okay, so that brings me to the uh, last part of my talk, which is about the quantum spin wall effect in graphene. Um, and so forget what you heard about Mare graphene. We no longer have Mare graphene. We now have samples in which we've twisted them uh, to a high enough degree that we don't see the effects of, of the boron nitride layer. So you can think of this part as sort of like or the intrinsic behavior of graphene, intrinsic uh, when subjected to certain extreme conditions. Um, so the motivation uh, for doing this, this experiment is uh, about, it sort of goes back to engineering electronic structures and engineering new states in, in solid state systems. So traditionally the way that you do this is that you do it by either electrostatic confinement to 2D, 1D, or zero dimensions uh, by taking a two-dimensional system and maybe applying some gates on the surface to locally uh, change the electron density and then you get basically wires and dots uh, out of these types of structures. Um, there are also uh, these intrinsic nanostructures uh, such as graphene or nanotubes or buckyballs which are intrinsically lower dimensional. Um, but there's also another way of making low-dimensional structures or low-dimensional electronic systems. And this actually goes back to topology and the quantum Hall effect, um, as we were discussing before. So this, again, this quantum Hall effect, the quantization of these Hall plateaus, uh, is related to topological quantum numbers, uh, which are in turn properties of filled electronic bands. Um, and in, this, in the case of this system, um, basically the, the precise nature of this uh, can also be traced to the idea that you have a one-dimensional state uh, traversing the sample or going around the sample, and you can't actually scatter from, from say, one edge of the sample into another. So you have a, a special kind of low dimensional, one dimensional quantum state uh, in which uh, scattering is suppressed uh, and it has one dimension or one unit direction around the sample. Um, so the current, for example, in this state, in this uh, minus 60 squared over H state, is carried by six one-dimensional systems that go around the edge of the sample. Um, and so that's, that's basically all I wanted to say about that. So uh, the question we'd like to ask is, are there other ways of making these low-dimensional quantum systems uh, based, basically based on non-trivial topology, um, which would give us these special edge states with possibly unique, unique properties? Um, so this dates back to a very important paper from Duncan Haldane, um, in which he asked the question, can we get a quantum Hall effect without higher levels? Can we get a quantum Hall effect in the absence of a magnetic field? And this has been followed by, very, uh, by important ideas from, from many other workers. Um, and what I'd like to say is that basically it was, uh, there was a huge breakthrough in 2007 uh, with the prediction and experimental discovery of this, this quantum spin Hall effect. Um, the quantum spin Hall effect, um, a lot of people will call it the first topological insulator, um, basically it has very interesting edge states, um, and these, ed these interesting edge states are basically just related to engineering the, the bands, the electronic bands of the system in a very particular way. So let me just describe the way that works. Um, so we have a two-dimensional system, this time instead of gallium arsenide, uh, we make a mercury telluride, which has a very strong spin orbit coupling. And the really interesting thing here is that if we make the, the thickness of this well, the width of this well, relatively small, 
it behaves exactly the way you would expect, which is to say it's a semiconductor uh, so that if you tune with a gate voltage, you tune uh, the conduction and you go from basically from the valence band uh, through the gap uh, into the conduction band so that if you place the gate voltage right in the gap here, you see a very, very, very high resistance as you might expect. Um, the really interesting thing is when you take this structure and you make it slightly larger, so you can see this is this is really not that larger than this. But now, when you act, when you uh, when you tune um, the with the gate voltage through this bulk gap here, what you see is not it's not a really high resistance, but you see an exact conductance of, of two e squared over h. And the reason for that is that basically the difference between this structure and this structure is basically that you just uh, created these new types of edge states, which are uh, traveling in opposite directions and have a special spin polarization. And so when you put the, the Fermi level in the bulk gap here, um, you're basically just seeing the conduction of these really interesting edge states. And yes, the only difference between this picture and this picture is that we make the, the thickness of the well slightly different. Uh, and what's happening here is, uh, as you tune the thickness of the well, basically the two bulk bands are coming together, they're touching, and at the point at which they touch, the system essentially behaves like graphene, as they, you know, like a semi -mount. And then as you, um, as you make the system even larger, the bands open up again, but when they open up again, you're left with these, these uh, interesting edge states uh, on the edge of the sample. And so this is what's known as the quantum spin hall effect. And this is the phenomenology of it. Basically, that you have an insulating uh, gas system. You have these counter-propagating spin-polarized edge states, so that uh, a state that goes in one direction has a spin that points up. For example, the state that goes in the other direction has a spin that points down. And these are really interesting because, basically, um, they're protected from scattering into one another. So they can basically carry information, quantum information, using spin. Um, and they're very robust because, again, because they don't scatter, so it's, it's difficult to lose information. And the current excitement about uh, the quantum spin hall effect is basically that you can think about combining states with superconductors, and you can produce exotic states such as uh, bionic fermions, and you can do things like topological quantum computing. So there's, uh, there's a lot of interest in these types of states now. Okay, what does this have to do with graphene? Um, so let's, we, we have to return back to our old friend, the n equals zero Landau level of graphene. Again, it's this fourfold degenerate state. Uh, so this is here you can see uh, dips and peaks in the density of states. Peaks where you have bands, uh, dips where you have gaps. Uh, and this is fully sublattice and uh, fully, fully sublattice and spin degeneracy of the um, so this state is electron pole symmetric. There's an uh, equal number, of, it's basically made up of an equal number of electrons and poles. Um, and so the nature, so the, the relevance of the quantum spin hall effect to, to this is uh, what the nature of the state at this charge neutrality point and the new equal zero point is. Um, so there are two possibilities. Um, so imagine taking this gate voltage uh, and tuning right to the middle here so that you've now filled up two of the bands and two of the bands are empty, okay? So there's actually two possibilities for this state. Uh, one is that it's an insulator and one is that it's a uh, quantum spin hall up conductor. Um, the reason for that is that, uh, is that because these states are electron pole symmetric, when you get to the edge of the sample, which is right here, two of them curve up and two of them curve down. And the order in which it occurs is really important because uh, on the left-hand state, you can see if you have a band here, there are, no, there are no electronic states at the Fermi level. Here, if you place the Fermi level here, there are exactly two electronic states at the Fermi level. One goes one way, which will spin up. One goes the other way, which will spin down. Um, and so there's an experimental question, which one of these is it? Um, and one thing I wanted to point out was that this state, uh, B, should actually prevail for a sufficiently large uh, Zeeman energy. You can see that because if you have the Fermi level here, you can see all the states below the Fermi level have spin down, all the states above have, have, uh, have spin up. So, nature gate has given us an answer. The, the, the answer is that it's the state on the left, basically, in a perpendicular magnetic field. Uh, 
this was discovered back in 2008. You can see that down here, um, this is new equal zero here, uh, as labeled up there. Basically, there's zero conduction there, right? It's an insulating state. So we were not happy with the answer that nature gave us, and so we, uh, we uh, basically decided to add say one energy again, uh, basically just uh, playing with the spins of the, of the system by tilting uh, the sample and increasing the magnetic field. So you can see what happens when we do this. Again, we took our samples to Florida. Um, we added an immense magnetic field, um, and we tilted the sample at the same time. And what that allows you to do is that, uh, uh, what I should say is that basically what we did was we turned graphene at new equal zero from this insulating state into this conducting state. And moreover, you can see this conducting state is very, very, very close to this uh, sort of benchmark value of 2e squared over h. So the, what basically the game that we're playing here, just to give you a little insight into why uh, this kind of funny picture over here, is that the overall structure of the Landau levels here uh, is controlled by the out-of-plane magnetic field. Um, so when we add an in-plane magnetic field, basically all we're doing is we're changing, we're playing with the spins of the system. Um, so basically all we've done here is add an immense amount of same amount of energy to the system. So what this looks like is uh, basically maybe we've induced this quantum spin all state in graphene. Um, but being experimentalist again, we can't just say that we have edge transport, we have to prove it. Uh, so we did two experiments to, to prove that we were seeing edge state transport here. One, uh, we measured the transport in the ball, or we measured transport on the left here. In tilted magnetic field, you can see this uh, insulator to conductor transport, uh, sorry, transition. Um, and transport, of course, tells you what, what transport along the edges look like, but it also tells you what's happening in the ball movement system as well. Um, capacitance, on the other hand, uh, basically just measuring the charging uh, between uh, a layer, between the graphene layer and the adjacent layer, tells you about the bulk properties of the system. Right? So, so here we're seeing an immense change in the conduction properties, but we measure the capacitance in tilted field as well. And basically, we see that this, this bulk gap here, the dip in the density of states, remains closed. Um, so that's one piece of evidence that, that we're seeing, basically, that this transition here is basically just happening along the edges of the sample. Um, and then this, the second experiment that we did to show that it has to be transport along the edges, uh, it goes under the name of non-local transport. So basically, what we're doing here is we have a sample with four contacts on it. Okay, so we're measuring the effect of two terminal uh, conduction uh, in each of these configurations. So here you can see that we're basically measuring transport from here to here um, along two edges. Here we're measuring transport from here to here along one edge in parallel with two edges. Uh, here one in parallel with three edges, and here two edges in parallel with two edges. The yellow here just means that we're not using that contact, it's just a little dab of metal on the edge of the sample. And what we see in the conduction here is that for this normal two-terminal transport, we see almost two e squared over h conductance. But then as we begin to flow contacts, what we see is a marked decrease uh, in the conduction here. And what's happening here is that one of, the, one of the edge states is equilibrating in one of these contacts. And so when you have two edges in, in, in series here, basically what you have is two quantum resistors of h over e squared in series with one another. So this is a pretty remarkable thing if you just think about conduction through a piece of metal, right? Imagine you have uh, a piece of metal and you have four contacts on the corner, and you measure uh, just between this edge and this edge, and then you just remove two of the contacts, you just measure between one diagonal and one diagonal. There's no way that you should expect to see a 50% decrease in the conductivity of that object, right? So this tells you that there is something interesting going on. And that interesting thing is that we're really seeing transport along the edges. Um, so, in summary, uh, the quantum spin Hall effect, um, which we, which was originally discovered in these mercury telluride semiconductor quantum wells, um, is, is basically represented by these counterpropagating spin polarized edge modes. Um, so, in one layer graphing, we were, we were able to induce this insulating to conducting transition at new equal zero in an extreme tilted magnetic field, um, and it shows all of the signatures of a quantum spin Hall effect. And what's, what's new about this, 
football. This was all new, but the new state that we see is actually this intermediate state uh, in between the in insulator and the conducting state. And this state actually has to do with the, the bulk spin structure of, of the graphene. So the, basically the, the um, <coughs> states of the graphene are intimately related to what's actually happening in the bulk. Um, so the picture, which comes from this theory of Maxim Karatonov, is basically when we have the insulating state, uh, the electron-electron interactions drive you to uh, this, this antiferromagnetic state. And then when we use a huge magnetic field, basically the spins want to align with the huge magnetic field, so they start tilting in the direction of the magnetic field. But we're also tilting the sample at the same time, so basically the structure, um, the spin structure of the ball looks like this, so all the spins are pointing in the same direction. And in the intermediate state, what we're seeing is what's known as a canted antiferromagnetic state. So you can imagine this kind of play between the same amount of energy which wants to do this, the antiferromagnetic energy, which wants to do this, so we have some state that in the bulk that basically has these canted spins, um, and then the edge state signature of that is basically something intermediate between this gap state and this uh, quantum spin ball state, where we basically have a tiny gap at the edge, but just by moving a little bit, uh, moving up or down Fermi energy slightly, basically we can see the edge states of this canted antiferromagnetic state. And that's, that's nice because this is a new kind of one-dimensional edge state. Basically, it has a gap, it's spin textured, um, and it's basically due to electron electron interactions in the system. Um, okay, so in summary, what we've seen is uh, this quantum spin hall effect in monolayer graphene, in intrinsic graphene, basically uh, in the absence of a moray. And then when we twist the graphene with respect to the more nitride to very low angles, uh, we can see interesting things like gaps and offset butterfly. And then the takeaway point is that basically this interesting physics came out of one of the simplest Van Rolls heterostructures. Uh, these emerging electronic states basically have exploited uh, a unique degree of freedom that we have in our Van der Waals assembly, which is this twist degree of freedom uh, between the layers. Um, so going back to this picture of Van der Waals heterostructures, um, we have many, many, many more opportunities uh, to make new electronic states, let's say coupling graphene and hexagonal boron nitride, but also semiconductors such as molydisulfide or tungsten diselenide, maybe uh, functionalized graphene such as this uh, Teflon, the 2D Teflon fluorographene. Um, basically, we barely scratch the surface. There's superconducting, semiconducting, mod Hubbard physics that calcutonize. Speaking of mod Hubbard physics, uh, the high TC superconductors such as the cuprates also flake well and turn into 2D systems. Uh, there's a lot to be learned about them uh, from, this, from this method. Nikkei superconductors, topological insulators, and maybe hundreds more uh, 2D materials that we can cobble together and try to create new electronic states. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. So it is, it is certainly possible to get one unit cell thick. Um, the, there was a paper by Andre Gunn of Ocelot in which they measured, that one in which they um, managed to exfoliate a single atomic unit or a single unit cell. Um, their particular one was happened to be insulating. Um, I think that they haven't published anything else about it. Um, and personally, I think the reason why is probably gets doped by oxygen environment, um, so I have a lot of ideas about the way that we can more systematically study one layers of high TC superconductors, for example, and see what kind of dimensionality effects there are there. So, but yes, it's certainly, it's certainly possible to do it. Good question. So in the case of, uh, in the first part of your talk, in the monitor pattern, which you uh, mentioned, so in the case of uh, hexagon boron nitrate and graphene, uh, so if I understand that, it's, so they are separated by finite distance. Um, or what is, how do you define in the Wonderwall's interaction with me that if there is no finite tunneling? 
Okay, well, okay, so finite distance, there, there, we don't arrange for there to be any finite distance you know, uh, in the sense that we just take the graph and place it on the core and I So do you think that are they by no, uh, are they covalently coupled or they are not? Uh, they're pretty, I mean, so at AFM and AFM suggests that they're fairly closely coupled. Um, when I say fairly closely, it, it looks like there's no you know, noticeable difference in, in the step height of graphene sitting on top of boron nitride. Uh, you really notice it because when you have some garbage under the surface, you can really see that it's not sitting exactly on top. Now, um, I think you asked something about tunnel. Okay, exactly. So th is there any finite tunneling between the uh, graphene and the hexagon boron nitride? Since there won't be any if they are, if they are coupled by a boron bond. I'm not wrong. Um, just a suggestion. You don't suggest that they're coupled by a bunch of balls, right? It just, uh, no, it I, just I believe that they are coupled. Oh, they are? Yeah. yeah, I believe that they are coupled. So which means then uh, it's a non coat So mean, there is no tunnel. I, mean, I don't know how you would see that. Um, so for example, how is this, yeah. layer, how is this different than two bilayer graphene, where there's an actual finite tunnel between the two layers, and they can stack in their AD? But now stacking or yeah, so um, so with graphene on boron nitride, so first of all, boron nitride is a very good insulator, so it would be a little bit hard. I mean, I don't know experimentally how you can tell. Um, I mean, you really need that. I mean, you, you need to have basically a source and a drain and, and uh, a way of measuring the tunneling between them. And I bet you can get tunneling processes between the graphene and boron nitride. We probably don't see those in, in our material because there's uh, yeah. Uh, I'll say that. Now, as for the bilayer, um, certainly you can make tunnel barriers in between. Uh, using boron nitride thin enough, you can make tunnel barriers in between two graphene layers. Uh, for example, um, you can use other materials as well. So I'm not sure, sure if I answered your question. Uh, oh yeah, you did. So the reason I asked this was because uh, you, you posed a very interesting question of how the gap delta of K yes. will be depend on delta of R and lambda. Yes. In the case. Yeah. So now, if there is a, because the gap can be, uh, like you suggested, there is a maybe a sub symmetric breaking. So if now the question is, uh, for example, you have in, uh, in your particular case, uh, it can be broken by either interaction or it can be broken by purely uh, kinetic energy effect. Yeah. Like strain or something like that. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, um, let me just point out something. Um, we, I, I, I skipped over a lot, obviously, I skipped over a lot of issues of the way that the graphene gets locally strained. Um, but I do want to point out one picture um, just to maybe uh, get you thinking about this a little bit. Um, but you can see in these STM images of graphene on boron nitride at various twist angles is that at low twist angles, that's right, at high twist angles, so low RA, um, there really is a qualitative difference between what the Moray pattern looks like. Um, and there's some recent work from Guyton's group that suggests that there might be some kind of, some kind of local strain developing at very, very low twist angles. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not un entirely understood from a microscopic point of view. Um, exactly, um, you know, exactly if you're, if, yeah, basically if, if the graphene is locally strained somewhat, and, and that's what's responsible for the, for the overall AP sublattice symmetry breaking. Um, so I mean, we still see a gap in, in these, these structures. It's somewhat lower. Um, but, but I, th I think better, I think basically better STM studies would, would help us. Mm -hmm. For example, like, the STM studies don't appear to be able to uh, resolve a gap, uh, even though they should have the, the, the energy resolution to do so. So, so that's still an open question why, uh, why they haven't been able to do good enough spectroscopy in order to see a gap. Or, so anyway, there, there are a lot of microscopic details. Uh, I was wondering how is there any way you can compute a twist angle with your assembly, or is that uh, once you assemble, you know what twist angle? Right. Okay. So, um, so in in our current technology, 
the best we can do is, uh, so when we exfoliate these crystals, so typically they would look like, um, so, so typically you can find one crystal graphic axis or one axis that's, that's clearly along one crystal graphic axis. And so when we find another piece that maybe looks like that, the, the best we can do is, uh, under the microscope when we're doing the transfer, um, is to align this crystallographic axis with this one. And that gives us about, I mean, I, I, I would say that what the best that we can do is roughly a half a degree or a degree. Um, but, so, so, the, these four, these four were an accident. We were, we were looking at the quantum spin hall effect and we discovered this. We discovered that we had these satellite peaks in this immense uh, gap or this immense insulating state. Um, and so we've, we've gone back and we've been able to reproduce the, the low twist angle uh, physics, at least uh, 45 Tesla, but we've been able to reproduce that. And we did that by doing this, by basically aligning these crystallographic gaps. But I would say we can't do much better than about a half a degree or a quarter degree. Um, but that, that's the most, <laughs> that's the sort of state of the art of aligning them uh, right now. You could, you could imagine doing something. You, I mean, you could imagine doing some, some slightly higher thing, or slightly lower throughput thing where you actually didn't, you exfoliate these things and uh, you know, did STM on them with a little tabletop STM or something, and then did the transfer, but uh, we haven't had the energy or time to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Peter's exact. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, one is, I believe, a very strong spin on the carbon scale. Yes. And the other is essentially a strong spin on the carbon scale. Do you mean graphic? Yeah, graphic. Yeah, I mean graphic, yes. Um, and if I remember correctly, the first time I ever read about spin more effect was in a paper by David Ashelon's group, right? That they were looking at the Edith Gowdy Marsalan, if I'm not mistaken. But there, an important component was this uh, uh, scattering of spin as a result of the of the K vector of the electron, right? So it's as if the spin rotates around the magnetic field that's essentially in parallel to the K vector. So I was wondering how does that play into this whole business here, right? Because uh, you have, I mean, in, in practically general theory, right, I would certainly think that this type of scattering plays an important part in the other activation of concentration, which you must have, right? Well, um, so in, in, in the bulk, the, the actual electron concentration is quite low because we're at, we're at the zero filling factor or the zero. But I, I'm not sure, so I'm not familiar with that David Upshaw paper. Um, yeah, well, but, it's, yeah. But, but, okay, so what I, what I will say is that um, one of the reasons that when the mercury powder at quantum wells, there's no magnetic field. Um, and so it's a time reversal symmetric system, and so basically the, the two states are prevented from scattering into one another. By yeah, but well, well, you don't have a very large k vector, but you want to apply a electric field, right? So, so they have to land, the electrons have to land, right? And so speed was okay. Yeah, um, yes. you're, you're really strong with the mass pattern. Yeah, yeah. 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 basically any perturbation adding to the, the edge states can't that scatter. This time reverse symmetry is just amazingly effective. Maybe I'll actually see what I mean. Yeah. Because I think we're talking about the speed point effect. I'm beginning to realize that. Yeah. But I used to know. Um, but as a follow-up, so when you talk about spin, again, probably Mercury can be terrorized in the end of the lecture on our planet, right? Because it's again, yeah, I mean, no, it, it, I don't think it, in, in Mercury Tower at quantum walls, it's, I mean, it's really the spin spin. It's, I mean, there's, a, there's even when you actually add brush bar, yeah. or a coupling or something like that, it's, it, the system is still time reversal symmetric, and it still respects, it still doesn't backscatter. So, in a sense, it doesn't really matter 
guess when you're talking about real spin or, or total spin. Um, just, I, I know it's probably on some people's mind. Uh, the reason that, so this, the analog of that symmetry in our system, it's, uh, our system is obviously not time reversal symmetric because it's, because we're working at 35 Tesla. Um, but if you look at the spins, if, if you look at the alignment of the bulk spins, um, basically, so we go from a, a state in which we do not have rotational spin symmetry uh, in the plane, basically, well, yeah, so in the cantonetic ferromagnetic state, um, where the spins are like this in the bulk, um, we do not have a spin symmetry about this axis, right? But but in the, in the ferromagnetic state, where we do have a spin symmetry about rotations about the total magnetic field, and it's basically that symmetry that, that protects backscatter in, in our system. It's not as robust as in, as in our three tucker and quantum spin. But in, in any case, so, so this is not, I'll just say one more thing about this. Um, as we go from uh, from the, if you think about the other way, where we start with quantum spin all, and we go to uh, the Cantonian anti-ferromagnetic state, or the, the, the anti-ferromagnetic state, we're not actually undergoing a topological phase transition. We're basically just reducing the symmetry of the system. So we're reducing the protection of the edge states by basically removing that symmetry of the system. So, so that, that's sort of the difference. Questions? Uh, can you say a bit more about that slide on the fraction of quantum Hall states that you could Yeah, sure. Happy yeah, to. Um, so, uh, so capacitance, capacitance is a nice way of measuring uh, the, the thermodynamic density of states, so dn by dmu, which is d here. Um, so basically it maps, uh, it maps compressible and incompressible states to uh, to sort of zero and one <coughs> on capacitance. So it's a nice way of probing transitions between compressible and incompressible states. So gaps in the spectrum show up as dips in in uh, in the density of states. So if we look at this, if we look at a trace with respect to uh, electron density here, what you can see is there's gaps uh, at, at, at low field. Uh, actually, I actually don't have the low field trace on there, but as we increase the magnetic field, you can see this Landau fan basically spanning out. You can see these new equals uh, plus and minus two gaps here. These are these are cyclotron gaps. These are broken symmetry gaps. This is again the lowest Landau level with the four states in there. And then if we zoom in on the lowest Landau level, uh, we, we can see fractional quantum Hall gaps. Um, this is nice because we actually can't see these as clearly in transport, so uh, it, Capacitance turns out to be a very nice way of, of looking at very sensitive gaps. Um, but these particular gaps, the five, the plus and minus five thirds, uh, had never been observed before in in graphene. Um, and from what I understand, and I have to be a little careful here because I don't understand that that well. But basically, um, the reason why five thirds hadn't been seen in uh, in normal mon massless monolayer graphene uh, has to do with the fact that it's very easy to produce excitations out of that state. So they're called valley skirming ones. Basically, the name uh, of the excitations out of the five-third state. Um, if you're familiar with quantum Hall, you can think of this as the as the equivalent of the one-third and minus one-third Laughlin states. Um, so, in any case, in in uh, symmetry. In AB symmetric uh, massless graphene, it's very easy to make excitations out of out of this one-third state. Basically, it, it, they involve hopping from one subclass to another. Um, so the fact that we observe them in our system and they don't observe them in the massless system seems to be an indication that what we're seeing is AB subclass symmetry breaking, because the excitations involve hopping from one subclass to another. As soon as we break that symmetry, it becomes much more expensive to hop electrons from the A sublattice to the B sublattice. And so the gaps that we see end up being much larger, and um, that points to why, why we're actually observing them. So, so, anyway, this is another piece of evidence that we're seeing sublattice symmetry breaking, A B sublattice symmetry breaking in our system. Can, can you see fractional or quantum Hall states in higher land level? Um, yes, we might have. Uh, <laughs> we can't see bypass. <laughs> um, but we, we can see, 
we can see fractional quantum all states in higher level levels. And actually, we can see a really nice uh, Genender Jane uh, opposite formula series if we zoom in here. So, you, I mean, you can't really see it here, but uh, with higher resolution, and, uh, you can actually see kind of really nice wiggles that converge on the on the new equals a half state, or the, the equivalent of the new equals a half state here. So, so, but we haven't seen, we haven't been able to see the this chaotic state that new equals a half, or new equals five four, whichever one I see in, in suspended graphene. So, maybe one more question, for you. Yeah. So just back to the four nine question. So, let's say if you press four nine five to the other side. So, so the force between them is just the boundary of force, but no copying.